Conservation District. Uh, I'll be leading you through the introduction to the series covering concepts on stream mechanics, watersheds, and stream health. Uh, this content will provide the foundation for discussing related topics uh, in the series in the weeks to come. So here's a look at all the topics we'll be covering for our stream health and stormwater series over the next month. We'll, if you haven't registered uh, the remaining, for the remaining events, you can still do so on our Eventbrite page. But today's webinar is titled Series Intro, What is Stream Health? This is the outline for what we'll be covering today. We'll start out talking about streams, uh, including the types of streams and stream dynamics or how streams move and change. Then we'll zoom out and talk about watersheds because we have to look at the whole watershed to talk about stream health. We'll talk about things that make up healthy watersheds and touch on how humans have changed watersheds in preparation for the rest of our stream health and stormwater series. As I mentioned, we're going to start by talking about streams. I apologize in advance if the first few slides seem a little like a vocabulary lesson, but uh, I want to make sure everybody has the basics of streams, watersheds, and stream health. So here we go. Uh, a basic definition of a stream is a body of water with surface water flowing within a defined bed and banks of a channel. This cross section of the stream shows the defined channel where the water flows the stream bed or bottom of the stream with raised banks on each side that, that define the channel. The low-lying area uh, on each side of the stream represent the floodplain and it stretches from the banks of the river to uh, the edges of the valley. The floodplain can also be called a riparian area as seen here. The amount of water or stream flow is controlled by three inputs, uh, surface water, subsurface water, and groundwater. Surface water, as the name implies, is the water that runs from the surface from adjacent slopes and hillsides. Uh, in urban areas, the surface area is usually a major source of stream flow. Subsurface water is water that infiltrates the soil and then moves laterally to the stream channel in the zone above the water table. So that's this area right here. The amount of subsurface water reaching the stream can vary significantly depending on things like rainfall, soil moisture, permeability, groundwater storage, evaporation, and upstream land use. The movement of subsurface water is determined largely by the, the gradient or the slope, uh, the type of, of soils and any barriers to flow. Groundwater is the water present in the Earth's surface and in small pore spaces and uh, fractures and rock formations. Groundwater enters the stream bed where the channel intersects the water table, providing a steady supply of water, uh, typically termed base flow during the dry and rainy periods. Uh, there are three classifications of streams, uh, ephemeral, intermittent, and perennial. Almost 60% of the streams in the U.S. flow seasonally or after storm events. These are the intermittent and ephemeral streams. Ephemeral streams flow only a short time as a direct result of a large storm or snow event when there's an increase in surface water runoff. Uh, the stream bed is above the water table throughout the year, so it doesn't receive groundwater flow. Ephemeral streams are small and normally have a dry channel during the year. Intermittent streams uh, are those where groundwater provides stream flow for part of the year. Uh, these stream beds are above the water table throughout the year. So, uh, I'm sorry. Um, runoff from rain supplements stream flow, but intermittent streams may dry up when the groundwater table drops below the elevation uh, of the stream bed during dry periods. And perennial streams are streams with continuous flow throughout the year. Uh, you can see a stream bed dips into the seasonal low water table there on the figure. 
Uh, it's just another graphic uh, showing the different parts of a stream. Um, note tributaries are side channels that flow into a, a, another uh, body of water. Um, the headwaters is the source of a stream and flows down into the canal. So, um, in order to talk about stream dynamics, uh, about how streams move over time, I thought it would be easiest to show a short video on why streams curve and how their shape changes over time. So, here goes with the video. Compared to the whitewater streams that tumble down mountainsides, the meandering rivers of the plains may seem tame and lazy. But mountain streams are corralled by the steep walled valleys they carve. Their courses are literally set in stone. Out on the open plains, those stony walls give way to soft soil, allowing rivers to shift their banks and set their own ever-changing courses to the sea. Courses that almost never run straight. At least not for long, because all it takes to turn a straight stretch of river into a bendy one is a little disturbance and a lot of time. And in nature, there's plenty of both. Say, for example, that a muskrat burrows herself a den in one bank of a stream. Her tunnels make for a cozy home, but they also weaken the bank, which eventually begins to crumble and slump into the stream. Water rushes into the newly formed hollow, sweeping away loose dirt and making the hollow even hollower, which lets the water rush a little faster and sweep away a little more dirt, and so on and so on. As more of the stream's flow is diverted into the deepening hole on one bank and away from the other side of the channel, the flow there weakens and slows. And since slow-moving water can't carry the sand-sized particles that fast-moving water can, the dirt drops to the bottom and builds up to make the water there even shallower and slower, and then keeps accumulating until it becomes new land on the inside bank. Meanwhile, the fast-moving water near the outside bank sweeps out of the curve with enough momentum to carry it across the channel and slam it into the other side, where it starts to carve another curve, and then another, and then another, and then another. The wider the stream, the longer it takes the slingshotting current to reach the other side, and the greater the downstream distance to the next curve. In fact, measurements of meandering streams all over the world reveal a strikingly regular pattern. The length of one S-shaped meander tends to be about six times the width of the channel. So little tiny meandering streams tend to look just like miniature versions of their bigger relatives. As long as nothing gets in the way of a river's meandering, its curves will continue to grow curvier and curvier until they loop around and bumble into themselves. When that happens, the river's channel follows the straighter path downhill, leaving behind a crescent-shaped remnant called an oxbow lake. Or a billabong. We have lots of names for these lakes, since they can occur pretty much anywhere liquid flows, or used to. Which brings up an interesting question. What do the Martians call them? Okay, so with this video, I mainly wanted to highlight that streams erode and predictable patterns. Um, the outside curves will always receive the higher velocity of flow, which causes erosion, while the inside curves will always be slower, resulting in sediment deposition. In Pennsylvania, we're fortunate to have a lot of water resources. In fact, Pennsylvania has more miles of rivers and streams than any other state, except Alaska, which is 14 times bigger in land area than Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has six major drainage basins across the state with over 86,000 miles of streams. Allegheny alone has four major rivers totaling 90 miles uh, and over 2,000 miles of stream. So let's save a drop to drink. This begins, this brings us to the concept of stream health. Um, there are three main aspects of stream health. There are physical properties, chemical properties, and biological properties which we'll dive into in a minute. But we can't talk about just the stream itself. We have to zoom out and look at the watershed as a whole because what we do on the land directly affects stream health. So let's talk about watersheds for a minute. No matter where you are, you're always in a watershed. Do you know which watershed you live in? 
if so, take a minute and type it in the chat box so we can see uh, where some folks are from. A watershed is an area of land that drains to a common point, such as a stream, uh, lake, estuary, wetland, or even the ocean. Water flows downhill, so the boundaries of watersheds are formed by topology, topography of the land, meaning watersheds are divided by hills and ridges. Smaller watersheds, such as this blue shape watershed here, is an unnamed tributary watershed that flows into the bigger watershed of Gertie's Run, which is the lighter blue color. Uh, Gertie's Run flows into the Allegheny River, which is a larger watershed, which flows into the even larger watershed of the Ohio River, and then the Mississippi, and finally the Gulf of Mexico. So our actions can have much broader impacts than just our local streams because we all live downstream up somewhere. Now that we understand the watershed concept, let's go back to those physical, biological, and chemical properties of the stream. When I say physical properties, I mean things that we can observe or occasionally smell. Uh, physical properties are where you take, have to take a broader look at the watershed rather than just the immediate stream itself. So when assessing the stream, the first thing you want to do is look around. Look at the up, upland landscape. Healthy uplands would typically be composed of diverse plant communities with trees and shrubs of various sizes to assist with water infiltration. In many urban watersheds, the uplands have been fragmented by development. However, even in Allegheny County, there are still many watersheds that are at least part of their upland community remains as green space. Watersheds with healthy uplands have the ability to capture precipitation and snow melt and store it for a safe, slow release to the streams. Healthy uplands also recharge those groundwater aquifers, providing high quality, clean water to the rest of the watershed. Next, look at the riparian areas or that floodplain. Healthy riparian areas filter sediment and reduce pollution by slowing, slowly releasing water. The slow release also recharges aquifers and increases stream base flow. Vegetation along the stream corridor and on its banks influences its stability. Stream side vegetation slows velocity of flood flows and seasonal water reducing soil erosion as well as deposit soil where it can improve land production. Riparian areas are often mowed right up to the stream, causing a loss of these essential functions. Finally, streamside vegetation provides a steady supply of leaves and woody vegetation to the stream that is used by fish and macroinvertebrates for shelter and food. Finally, take a look at the stream itself. The water should appear clear and free of sediment. Healthy stream beds and channels have diverse habitats and food resources available. Habitats can include uh, different sizes of rocks on the stream, stream bottom, leaves, sticks, or overhanging vegetation. Uh, so you can get a pretty good idea of stream health just by looking at the watershed from a holistic viewpoint. To dive deeper into stream health, you have to look at the chemical and biological aspects of the stream. Scientists use chemical and biological parameters to evaluate water quality in the stream and its ability to support a thriving aquatic community. Since, since the quali chemical quality of water is important to health, as to, to the health of humans, as well as plants and animals, it's necessary to assess chemical attributes of water. The chemical properties of water can affect aesthetic qualities such as how water looks, smells, or tastes. These chemical attributes of water can also affect its toxicity and whether or not it's safe to use. It's important to note that the appearance of water can often be deceiving. Crystal clear water can contain unseen chemicals, uh, bacteria, and metal contaminants. Most changes in chemical attributes are caused by pollution. There are two ways in which pollution enters the stream. Point source pollution is when chem contaminant originates from a single source. Examples include wastewater discharge, contamination from a leaky septic system, chemical and oil spills, or illegal dumping. 
While point source pollutants originate from a single source, it can affect miles of waterways and oceans. The second way is non-point source pollution, which is from overland flow. These include many agricultural and stormwater runoff or debris blown into the waterway from the land. Non-point source pollution is the leading cause of water pollution in the US, but it's difficult to regulate since there's no single identifiable culprit. Water quality experts have determined what levels of chemicals, metals, and microbes in streams are healthy for a particular use, such as drinking, recreating, irrigating, or supporting fish. These safe levels have been adopted by state and federal governments as water quality standards. As volunteers, monitoring water quality can address many questions about stream health, such as, is the stream changing over time? Is the stream cleaner upstream or downstream of a certain place, such as a tributary? Does the stream change throughout the year? Will this stream support trout or other species of fish? And are there land use activities affecting stream health? The water quality component addresses six categories, sediment, nutrients, bacteria, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and chemicals. Sediment is delivered to the stream through the erosion of upland areas and from the stream banks. Too much sediment may cover gravel on a stream bed, smothering eggs previously deposited in the gravel by spawning fish or burying the substrate or stream bottom needed by aquatic insects. Measuring the amount and size of sediment in stream water and on the stream bed helps determine whether there is an excess in where it may be coming from. Nutrients are chemicals that are commonly found at low levels in natural fresh water. Phosphorus and nitrogen are the major nutrients that cause plant growth in water and therefore must be measured to determine whether they are at levels high enough to stimulate the overabundant growth of plants. Too many nutrients can lead to excessive growth of aquatic plants, that the living and decaying vegetation robs the stream of its oxygen, which fish and other aquatic organisms need to survive. Coliform bacteria are used as an indicator of the sanitary quality of the water for drinking and swimming. Fecal coliform bacteria in streams can come from a variety of sources, including sewage, animal feedlots, pasture land, and cities. The discovery of fecal coliform bacteria in streams is an indication that disease-causing organisms may be present. Cool water temperatures and high dissolved oxygen levels are critically important to fish and other aquatic organisms. If the water is too warm or the oxygen level is too low, most fish won't be able to survive. Hence, measurements of temperature and dissolved oxygen are important indicators of stream health. Chemicals are used in manufacturing, pest control, normal household use, agriculture, forest, and city operations. They are intended to be safely handled and controlled, but occasionally can find their way into streams. The results can be catastrophic to the point of killing everything, but lower levels of it can be less catastrophic, but still be considered dangerous to humans who drink the water and eat fish. In weightable streams, there are Three most common biological organisms studied are fish, algae, and macroinvertebrates. But other organisms such as amphibians and freshwater mussels can indicate good stream health. Because populations of fish and aquatic insects respond to changes in stream quality and water quantity, determinations of their diversity and abundance are indicators of stream health. For example, streams are considered of poor quality support only a few species of organisms that can tolerate conditions such as low dissolved oxygen. In contrast, healthy streams support diverse populations of organisms with specific requirements such as high dissolved oxygen and low temperature, like the brook trout in the picture there. Macroinvertebrates are most commonly used to assess stream health for many reasons. They're affected by the physical and chemical conditions of the stream. They show the impacts of habitat loss, 
not detected by traditional water quality assessments. They can't escape pollution uh, and show the effects of short and long-term pollution events. Some, very some are very intolerant of pollution. They live in the stream full time versus a water chemistry sample that's a snapshot in time. They are a critical part of the stream's food web and they are relatively easy to sample and identify. There are several reasons why each and every one of us should care about stream health. Streams play a critical role in the quality and supply of our drinking water by ensuring continuous flow to flow of clean water to surface waters and helping recharge underground aquifers. In the continental US, 357,000 miles of stream provide water for public drinking water systems, which is used by approximately one third of the US population. Agriculture and stream health are often at odds as agriculture contributes to many negative impacts on streams. However, farmers depend on clean water to irrigate farm crops, water livestock, and we depend and water livestock that we depend on for food. Healthy intact ecosystems are essential to the multitude of activities we do on the water, from boating and swimming to fishing and watching wildlife. Outdoor recreation and ecotourism rely on the maintenance of healthy watersheds and the protection of open space. If food, water, and drinking water weren't enough of a reason, how about the economics of clean water? Investing in the maintenance of healthy watersheds can significantly lower associated costs of water treatment and flooding. Healthy watersheds also avoid expensive restoration activities, sustain revenue generating recreational and tourism opportunities, minimize vulnerability and damage from natural resources, and support millions of jobs nationwide. So let's talk about the human impacts. People have tried to control rivers and streams for thousands of years. They've been modified more than any other type of ecosystem. Uh, according to the USGS, we use an estimated 322 billion gallons of water per day in the US. There are over 84,000 dams have been built to capture water for drinking, irrigation, and flood control. Water is pumped for agricultural industry and residential use and there are over 6,000 bridges in the US. Sand and gravel are excavated from our riverbeds and all too often trash and other wastes are dumped into our rivers. Other less obvious activities that can affect river ecosystems include removing trees, overgrazing stream banks, and over fertilizing or using too much pesticide on crops or lawns. We've built roads and utility systems adjacent to our streams, and we'll repairing vegetation up to the edge of the stream bank. This is happening on both private property and on our public green spaces. And we've channeled and strained streams that naturally want to meander. We'll talk more about these impacts throughout this series over the next month and how they affect stream health. So to wrap up, the, phase, the phrase, everyone lives downstream, has become a common saying in water management. Water does not stay in one place, but instead moves as a result of natural forces. As stream flows down gradient from their headwaters, they pass through forests, farms, and communities on the way to larger streams and ultimately the ocean. Along that path, any use of the watershed or its water in a manner that degrades water quality or changes how the stream acts impacts stream health. The shape of the land and how it's used play a large role in determining stream health. A fast flowing stream in a steep mountain setting takes a different characteristic than one slowly meandering through a broad valley. Natural features are often modified by human activities. Building dams, removing vegetation, and pumping water from the stream are potentially harmful to stream health. In maintaining stream health, in human uses that the stream supports, it's critical to remember that what happens in a particular place within a watershed has the potential to influence the characteristics of the watershed downstream. We depend on healthy watersheds for our drinking water, food, economy, and recreation. A good way to protect water quality is to undertake wise land use planning that recognizes sensitive areas in the watershed.
We hope to see you back on Thursday for the second installment of our stream health and stormwater series, evaluating stream health, what to look for. And we'll talk about um, how to measure those physical, chemical, and biological properties that we discussed here today. With that, thank you for listening. Um, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Amy. That was a great presentation. Um, I, my name is Riley and I've been monitoring the chat box. We just had one question during the presentation about the recordings and when and where they'll be available so folks can revisit any of these presentations for students or for their own pleasure. Yeah, so um, we will send out a follow-up email with links to the recordings um, probably at the end of the entire series. Um, but those will be posted on our website at accdpa.org. Anything else? Hi, Amy. I have a quick question. Um, okay. And it's possible I missed this. Sorry, I was trying to jostle a few things, but this is not my field of study, not my profession at all, and I'm wondering if you um, might be willing to share some resources or opportunities in which people can volunteer to put what you're teaching to practice. Yeah, we can follow up with those um, opportunities in our follow-up email, certainly, um, and we'll be talking about ways that uh, people can uh, incorporate some of these these activities into their, their everyday lives at I think our last webinar in a series. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned. Anyone else? All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to our intro. And again, we hope to see you back on Thursday. Um, and I'll be talking about evaluating stream health. Thank you.